Dale Muhammad, in case you have forgotten in the few minutes between there and here. So. Yes. We're all glad to refresh your memories. Um, we're here to moderate, and we use the term exceptionally loosely. People should feel free to chime in as they so desire. A discussion on the future of disability rights activism in fandom. And there are a lot of different aspects of this. Um, we've spent much of the day talking about representations of disability in popular culture and various forms of media. There's also work that I know many folks have been doing about the accessibility of cons and other fandom related spaces and a broader discussion about how we can engage the considerable fandom community in support of the priorities of the disability rights movement. But our hope here is to jumpstart that discussion so that when you all go back to your respective communities of origin, we can hopefully start something that will last far longer than even this extraordinary conference. Yay. Uh, ditto. No. Um, and you've heard this actually from me earlier in the day and from Ari. You know, the, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great con and, and the idea is we're addressing the idea of disability and a variety of fandoms. We've had comics, we've had films, we've had television series talked about, you know, um, animation, a number of things have come up. And one of the things I imagine we'd all like to see is that things would be better a year from now. Um, and I think that's one of the things we get caught up in Washington. We're working on disability policy issues generally. And from year to year, we hope to make things better. Um, but none of that happens automatically. And so in some ways, what we're hoping this, this, this post-conference discussion is take everything that, we talk, that, that, that everyone has talked to each other about today, both in the sessions and to each other in the hallways, and say, all right, so this is exciting. What are we going to do? We, us here as a group, and we as individuals to actually change the status quo. Um, you know, what are, what are ideas we have for, I guess, what's, uh, where some of the big uh, roadblocks might be? What ideas do we have as single like leverage points to make a big change? And then what are things that we're willing to commit to? You know, I'm going to sign my name in blood at the end, end of the night saying this is what I'm going to commit to. So a year from now I can come back and say, you know, by God, this is what we as a community have achieved in fandom between here and now to move disability forward. There's a blood-soaked pen in the back of the room, so we're prepared on that front. Let's kick things off, and I think Day, Day has really hit the nail on the head. I'll add my ditto to her earlier ditto. But let's kick things off by starting with barriers and opportunities for change in the fandom community. Um, we're both people with backgrounds in public policy, but one of the things that working in public policy really shows is the limit to what government can do. A lot of the so change we need to see takes place in the social and cultural spheres. Um, and fandom is obviously a great place to start thinking about it, given that it's near and dear to many of our hearts. Um, would anyone like to volunteer with just uh, a thought about what they might want to see change vis-a-vis -vis how disability is approached in fandom? Anyone? Wow, fandom is perfect on disability issues. I'm, I'm excited. Sure, sure. Um, would anyone like to volunteer? And we have Alex Umstead, uh, who's right over there to my left and your right, um, walking around with a portable mic. So just raise your hand if you want to volunteer to just name an opportunity for change that exists in how the fandom community approaches disability. We got somebody right in the center. Well, I mean, I think this is a, this is a pretty obvious, but it's um, those moments uh, as happened a couple of years ago when um, there's a major change instituted uh, in a character, I'm talking about comics, um, uh, like the you know the reboot of Bat of Oracle turning her into Batgirl and the uh, outcry among certain parts of the fan community uh, against that and the the kinds of discourses that were produced by that I think that's a really you know what we call a teachable moment in my field. 
That, that's a great start. To, to seize on those sorts of moments. So how would you summarize that? All right. So uh, if I would have... Actually, I don't have to rephrase too much of it. Basically, it, it's um, taking advantage of, of events. Um, uh, I guess where disability either is is or is not pre prevalent, and there's a lot of attention. So let's let's see if we can get a list. Can we, in the um, Word file, the huge Word file of projectedness? Yeah, and feel free to paraphrase me even shorter if people can do that. I'm a lawyer. I talk in long sentences, so. How do we take advantage of teachable moments? That's the first thing on our list. First opportunity for change in fandom. That's excellent. That's absolutely excellent. Who wants to throw something else out? Oh, sorry. Yeah, could you hold it? Because I'll just drop it, and she'll pick it up, and it'll be ugly. Um, I, actually, I was thinking something that Day said earlier in one of the panels. I'd like to see more background imagery um, of disabled um, depictions. You know, the, the crowd scene with the person in the wheelchair, or the guide dog, or the, just the cane, even, of, of uh, someone visually impaired, or to see people in the background um, signing. You know, to, to see them... You know, one of the one of the aspects of comics I always liked was when they would combine the everyday with the comic world. Um, my, I just we just finished. Forgive me, we just finished um, Kingdom Come in my class, and I guess I'm a little Kingdom Come stuck. Um, but the the idea of the background plays such an important role. I think we we don't give it enough credit. So I I like to see artists engage in that a little bit. Putting disability in the everyday of the comic world. That's, that's spectacular. And it's, you would think it would be a piece of low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. all things considered. But, but a very important piece, because I think it becomes a subconscious issue then for the young readers. Absolutely. Well, and from an organizing perspective, we, we want to be looking for important pieces of low-hanging fruit. We want to be able to get the ball rolling. And that seems like a great place to start. We're getting, uh, There's one over there. Oh, sorry. Awesome. There's somebody over there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Awesome. These are good. Hi, just um, pertinent to that last comment. <clears throat> when we do see someone um, do that, include disability in the everyday of the background of a comic, to be sure to compliment the comic's creator or writer. You know, I went to see a film called uh, My Brooklyn recently. It's been circulating a lot to a lot of progressive audiences. It critiques the um, economic, the way that Brooklyn has been developed. Um, and afterward I talked, there were so many good things about the film. And afterward I talked with the filmmaker and just said, you know, I just wanted to say, I love the way that, that disability was depicted in the film as part of the background, as part of the everyday life of Brooklyn. And she said, nobody's ever said that to me before. Thank you. Acknowledging positive representations. Actually, can I get um, This isn't directly disability related, but I think it's tangentially related. Can, can you lean into the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, don't apologize for your thoughts. Put them out there. Let's do it. Um, Bring it on. The, this um, right way to be a fan stuff and how... Um, the, this whole idea that you're not a true fan unless, you've, unless you own all the back issues or you've seen you know, every episode of the television show. I think that's um, really damaging and it really cuts people off that's from great. fandom. And it, it's also, I think there's a lot of implicit ableism in there in terms of not everyone can read comics or not everyone has access to such and such narrative in one form, but they might be able to access in another form, and all of those things are valid. Um, so just doing, um, just changing our, our attitudes and really advocating for, you know, all fans are good fans, so. I like that, all fans are good fans, no matter how, from all the way obsessed to just casually, yeah, I just saw an, a, an animated Batman episode and it was okay. So one ends the other, it doesn't matter. All fans are good fans. 
Oh, that sounds spectacular. So there's no wrong way to be, to be a fan or to eat a Reese's. Any unless of you remember it, that? Unless it's my Reese's. Oh, yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Uh, and I also just wanted to, bringing it back to the, to the Oracle moment and relating it to what this, this lady said, um, also it, it, what was also I think very instructive or useful about that moment was that there was uh, the fan discourses um, led to actually uh, Gail Simone, the writer, actually engaging and having to defend you know, her decision, or it was an editorial decision, but having to defend this, this new version of the character. And, in, in other words, engaging with the creators and getting them also. So, yes, praising them and, 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 and uh, giving credit when, when, when they do the good stuff, but when they do the bad stuff, also calling them on it and, and getting them involved. Yep. So calling out bad actors. Excellent. I think one of the thing, the first things we need to do is engage in a little self-love as fans and acknowledge it's okay to kind of like things that are kind of awful. Uh, <laughs> like Shocked I, <laughs> yes, I love horror. Now, there are so many things we could talk uh, about that are wrong with horror, but I'm okay for liking it. I just want it to be better. That's all. It's not a matter of being a bad fan, as you would say. It's It's just... Wanting it to be better. I'm trying to think of how we would, we oh, would phrase I'm sorry. that. So I stepped on the dog. I'm sorry. About that, so. It's safe to be a fan. Sure. Um, we, we've received a request for folks to speak a little bit louder. The fan is making some noise. That's a little bit hard on our... Uh, interpreters and probably a variety of other people in addition. Okay, so b back here. Um, so there's another aspect to visibility and that's more of just actually the visibility at events like cons and everything. Mm -hmm. So one, definitely having people when there are not like accessibility, like you know, there's not an accessibility uh, statement on like the, the cons website to actually have somebody, you know, raise an issue and bring that up. But what I really think about is several years ago at the Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle, there was a one-day overlap with this uh, conference on assistive technologies. Mm -hmm. And you had a lot of parents there who had brought their kids to, you know, who, sorry, I seem to be getting a bunch of tech spam at the moment. <laughs> um, da, da, da. Um, you had parents bringing their kids who are assistive technology users to this. So one day overlap, so you had all these kids seeing people in costumes and they were curious. So all of a sudden you had a bunch of people in wheelchairs at this con. And it's just like when you have that sort of just strikingly visible moment, you know, we do recognize that a lot of disabilities are invisible, but when we can take advantage of something that's more uh, blatantly, you know, seeable, you know, it makes people go, Oh, yeah, there were a lot of people in wheelchairs this year. That was kind of cool to see. You know, you just get into that, you know, it gets into people's minds of, oh, that was different. It was okay. So, so I hear two really important issues that you're highlighting. One is the accessibility of cons and fandom space, which is huge. So inquiring about that. Exactly, exactly. And the other is... Um, raising the profile of disability and <laughs> fandom more generally. So increasing attendance and increasing visibility. Exactly. Um, the other thing I think we need to do is um, address the issue of our own community. Like, for example, the deaf community. I know when I went to Gaudet, very few discussions ever took place around how are we represented in popular culture. And that's you know something that I think we focused a lot on public policy, public changes, but we didn't think about how we were represented. And I, <clears throat> that shift might have changed with Switch of Earth, which, you know, has given people <clears throat> some pride, but I think, you know, there's some troublesome issues in the series that, you know, I, we need to call them out on or praise them all that. So, um, and I think some people have done that, but, you know, I don't think has elevated, um, the issues within our own community about representation, that's something that 
that's something that we we could do on our own, and um, and we need to do that. Actually, that's a great point, and it bounces nicely off the last one. The last one was going to other cons and raising our presence amongst general fandom, but the idea is talking in our own disability community about the things we love, sharing our passions and the things that we geek out over, um, and also recognizing that it is a legitimate, it is a legitimate form of, of advocacy. That's spectacular. And we want to be that bridge. You know, we want disability self-advocacy organizations to be talking to creators. We want to be driving a conversation where the traditional organizations in the disability rights movement like NAD or NFB or Nickel or what have you look at culture as a space where they engage in advocacy in just as much as government. To kind of follow up on that and, and to go back to your original point about writing something in blood, has anybody ever thought of proposing a panel at the SDS on how to crypt the, the comic culture or the pop culture world? There's a cool idea. I'm sorry. Where did you say? SDS? SDS, yes. Uh, so, uh, for it. those of you who aren't sure what that is, um, that are, might be more familiar with the comic book world, that's the um, academic field for disability studies, Society for Disability Conference. And out of curiosity, where is the next SDS conference? Believe it or not, it's in Orlando. Ah. It's at Disney World. Compelling. <laughs> Compelling. Well, uh, let me just, uh, let's take a, a brief interlude to say that if anyone is interested in helping um, organize a panel of that nature. It sounds like we have two folks who are willing to be the potential uh, points of contact. I didn't catch your name. Um, my, my name's Lydia. I'm actually doing a panel. Lydia Fecto, I'm actually doing a panel this year in Orlando on um, adjuncting with a disability and, and how to bring disability in the academic community. But I would love to uh, talk to the, some of the people at the SDS about doing something like that, for the, obviously for the next year's co um, conference. Lydia, can you spell your last name? Sure, Evis and Frank, E-C-T-E-A-U. So, so any of you who are interested in bringing this conversation to SDS, talk, talk to, Lydia. to Lydia. I was gonna say Lydia and Day, but it looks like Lydia is the main point. Lydia is the lead. I will follow wherever she leads. Okay, so. okay. Oh, see, now everyone's gonna get quiet because they're like, "Oh no, I'm gonna have to do stuff now." Gotta yes. be action items. <laughs> um. Run screaming. <laughs> Rachel. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't really. We'll come right back. Actually, I was gonna. Let me, f let me first talk about what I was going to first say, and I, I was going to bring up the issue of cosplay. Um, I love it when I see, I, I see them on Facebook, I see them on Pinterest, of these, they're not necessarily disabled characters, but they're people with disabilities and they dress up as their favorite characters. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, they're kind of cripping characters or um, they're taking ownership of characters, and I, I find that very interesting. I um, love it. I want to write yeah, stuff like, good enough one day that somebody wants to cosplay my characters. <laughs> like there's a like I I'm, I just brought up a picture. It's a little boy in a wheelchair, and he's he's dressed up as Doctor Who, and his wheelchair is the TARDIS. And I I think that's awesome. I think that's awesome. But related to this SES comment, I think it's wonderful. But one of the things we did today was we didn't want to make it too academic. We wanted mm -hmm. to bring it down just a little, but we also want to work together. Um, anyway, I speci we specifically encouraged undergraduates par to participate. Um, we did everything we could to, to Skype people in because we really wanted them to get some experience presenting. Um, so, um, and we, it relates to the issue, I think we put it in our call for papers, is, you know, we need to make information accessible, not just published, but in language we can understand. And we need to make things like disability understandable to everybody with disabilities, so. I think that's a spectacular point. I'm really glad you raised the issue of the often inaccessible nature of academia. It's been something I've felt very strongly about for some time. 
there is a tendency in some circles um, to look at uh, making something harder to understand <laughs> as a feature rather than a bug. And if you're talking about accessibility in language that 95% of your constituency um, or the general public can't understand, then at least from my perspective, you're doing it wrong. These, these are ideas that emerge you know, from and for the masses, and it, it's important that we not let academia appropriate them. Right, and I actually think the, this, this convention is actually a good example of, of some of the things that I, I tend to like in conventions. We do, have, we do have people who are speaking from the academic background and their studies uh, in detail, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking of comics because mostly that's what I was paying attention to and where I sat in on, but um, we also have people who are fans of things and use that personal uh, passion and, and knowledge and we're able to present on that. And then you've got the policy wonks here who are looking at some of the structural aspects and what it means and trends. And um, I can also raise my hand from that, and I know there are other people from that creator side of things who, who draw and write. So in some ways, you're covering these uh, multiple people who all have some sort of a stake in it and it adds, adds a balance because by doing that here, we then get charged up, energized, the knowledge is shared, and then it's go forth to those separate arenas such as the academic conference, such as fan-based conferences, such as talking to other creators and actually um, impacting those other um, uh, entities and arenas. So let's go back to where we were before. Um, I remember Sorry, Diane, that was really long. I remember what I want to say, and Rachel reminded me. Um, I sorry, think- could you, could you speak oh, up? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the thing to me, the, the greatest transformative potential in fandom is the transformative part. Like, <laughs> let's not forget that this is a creative space. Mm -hmm. um, and really um, sort of mobilizing um, fan creators and cosplayers and fan artists um, to, to depict disability in a sort of more informal way, just in terms of um, that, that being a thing that people do. Not, you know, it's not a, you sit on a panel and have a long discussion about it, it's you write fan fiction or you draw art or something, and it's a more, it's a way of creating representation on our own terms. Ooh, I like that, creating representation on our own terms. There's, there's one of the bullet points, because we've been talking about taking these ideas and promoting them for others to do, but I think that's an important point of there, for those of us who have that creative bent to actually go ahead and, and do it ourselves. That's, that's exceptional. I, I do wonder, and maybe I can just turn this around and ask a, a connected question, though. Um, I know one of the issues that comes up in a lot of communities with regards to <coughs> writing in particular is that there's often not a great deal of willingness on the part of um, the gatekeepers of a lot of creative field, fields to allow the voices of marginalized communities to the table. And obviously, you know, we live in uh, a time when the internet has really made it possible for anyone to be a publisher, but there's a, being a publisher and then there's being a publisher. And having access to traditional media or even the larger independent media can be very valuable. So I wonder if we may also need to be having a conversation about both how we can get our community more engaged with creative pursuits, but also how we can open some of the doors that may now currently be closed to those parts of our community that are already engaged in that work and you know, are just running into a barrier posed by gatekeepers that don't think there's a market for disability. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and uh let people know that I'm, it, one way we can be visible and that you can do tonight is let me interview you for Den of Geek. <laughs> um, we're gonna be covering this event and it's a major website uh, and they thought that CripCon was important enough and an important enough con that they sent me here so that I, you, you can literally be visible on the site. So how to contact you is? Uh, you can either go ahead and grab me uh, and I can give you a card or I write for denofgeek.us. Um, we, because I'm a writer for it, I also get to review things from a disability lens and it's always sort of on the side and 
I've done things like the top 10 characters with disabilities. I've done mental illness in movies, things like that. So if you have the power to, even if it's reviewing movies on your own Tumblr, um, acknowledging the lens of disability, and I think the more we do that, uh, the more it becomes a normalized way to look at media. So who wants to be interviewed by Den of Geek? Come on, come on guys, I swear I don't bite. I do. Can you say a little bit about what Den of Geek is? Sure, um, we, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> there's a British version of our website, which is denofgeek.com, and we recently started the United States version of this. Uh, we write about everything from daily news that, you know, about geek, geeky stuff like movies and comics and things like that. Uh, we write your traditional top 10 list, you know, your top 10 favorite characters of South Park, whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, we also do editorials on video games and movies and comics and TV shows. Uh, and then we do like reviews. So it's really a little bit of everything in the geek world. Um, I also have a Twitter. Uh, I mostly do horror and sci-fi, but I also love My Little Pony, so you'll find that on there too. <laughs> um, but I would love to interview people to, you know, put on the website so that people know, like, we're comic fans, we exist, and this is what we love, and that we are visible in these spaces. So I want to take one more thing around barriers and ch opportunities for change, and then I, I think we might want to tr start to transition to talking about strategies and tactics we can be using. And commitments. To get, uh, yes, yes, we're definitely going to get to that. Don't scare them. <laughs> Should be fun. I'm just trying to think of whatever it fits this topic now or the next strategies or tactics. Well, one of the, well, I'll, I just might as well go you, into You also have the, you have the last word <laughs> on, on barriers, too, so you can go in either direction. Um, okay. Um, as for strategies and tactics, I think one of the barriers is that, you know, you write what you know. And, um, and if you never, you don't have a disability yourself, you've never met a person with a disability, how you... How you expect to write about them? And yeah, it's easy to ask somebody. Well, you know, you know, he's deaf. He obviously can't hear. And then, but what set of experience comes with that? And even just knowing somebody, it's not enough. And and so I think it's. Um, and then if they do write about it, then they get lambasted and for it. And and you know, you know, it's counterproductive. So, but obviously, maybe there's a story they want to tell. They just don't know who to talk to. So we need to set. Um, like maybe on Den of Geeks or someplace like where if they want to talk to somebody who has a disability and be open about it and then, or get advice of like, I have a deaf character and he or she's in this situation, what should he do? And I can say, well, the, here are multiple directions you can go in. This, all these are be realistic experiences from different kind of people. And that way, you know, um, you wouldn't sacrifice your creative choices but then you would also be true to the disability and true to your story. And so um, I don't know what would be a clear, easy cipher for you to do that, but um, I would be more than happy to talk to anybody. Create kind of a format for the community and creators to be in dialogue with each other. I'm, f I'm afraid of just saying like creating one set of experiences because my set of experience in another person was here, said experience is totally different. And I cannot say, you know, I would not say my said experience is the definite experience. And I really do, I really want to shy away from that. And because there's many ways to be deaf, there's many ways to be blind, there's many ways to be all that. And, um, and that's all perfectly okay. So I would rather give them, give somebody a chance to talk about the different experiences that one can have depending on how late they acquire their deafness Maybe they were born deaf, did they learn sign language, did they learn all these things? So I just really want to give them a chance to talk to somebody with a disability if they choose to do so, and I you know, think that's the one way. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, there are a couple of spaces that have, have started or tried to do that. Um, one of them is the National Novel Writing Month forums. 
um, I don't know how many you participate, but um, every November from the first to the end, uh, and it was declared National Novel Writing Month, and I think it's like nanowrimo.org. If you go to the website, they have a series of forms, and one of them is called Ask the Expert. And a lot of times there'll be somebody asking, so I'm writing a character that's deaf, you know, what do I do? And, and actually, usually multiple people can then answer that. And part of that is, and there's always that caveat, this is my experience. It may not be true for everyone, but it is true for me. Um, and one of the things they talked to some of the writers about was that you may get, may get criticized, but at least you can say, you, at least you know that you wrote it true for at least one person um, with that disability, and you, you, did, you did some homework, and that kind of offered some support for that. Uh, I know there's one on Tumblr as well that collected that. I think the tough thing is to make sure people can turn around answers quickly. Um, but I know that's one. I know the increased visibility. If you're going to events and, there's, and there are writers there, oh, somebody who's deaf, I have a question for you. Um, and, and they start to do that. Because at, at the end of the day, we're, we're geeks, we're fans too. And so half of that is, is loving, what you, loving what you love in geekdom. The second part of it that makes you a fan is sharing that. And the moment somebody goes, you like the same thing they do, they're gonna they're gonna ask you the questions, and you're gonna get that opportunity to do that sharing. So, so I think that that really helps. But but it but it is that point. It's where do people get those answers? So I was going to suggest that we read off a list of uh, some of the things that. So maybe we do want to move straight into the tactics discussion um, while we um, still have time. Does that sound good to everyone? Um, I'm happy to read both, uh, off of what we just said, as well as tactics. Um, maybe one of the places that you can create, I know that Career Services are doing a repository of um, disability stories, is it? Diane? Repository, digital repository? Um, I, I was just, uh, oh. We're doing a Beneath the Surface, which is a digital repository on digi disability and popular culture. And it will include three components. A journal, for which we have an ISSN number from the Library of Congress, which will eventually come to fruition as a journal in that sense. Um, we have the conference proceedings for everyone who's given permission for what happened from the symposium to be included in the digital repository. And then Rachel has been running um, or operating um, a site on Facebook, which is going to be transitioned onto the digital repository as well. One of the things I was going to say is maybe a place where, like I know for myself, my, my students, when we do my disability, I'm oh, sorry, my disability and lit class, um, I make them write a fiction story with a disability theme. Um, maybe giving people a place to post material would be a, a good start. That, you know, some sort of yeah, kind of. Do you have something like that? Oh. Did I did I hear? A, did I, hear I, a I run. Yeah, I run the Disability Cultural Center Tumblr. If any of you guys want to put any of your stuff on there, and it's not you know horrifically offensive, and trust me, in order to offend me, it's going to have to be real bad. <laughs> right, we would love to put it on DCC. There we go. And and the other thing could also be um, if if they if they don't want to do that, they are also. We can push for you know those different magazines to submit them for actual public publication because I know once you, once you post it on the net you, you're burning your rights so right. so there is that too so and, and just yes I'm going to use that that C commitment word so so because we we have had some of that come up so so one of them what we're hearing now is is um, is, is uh, I think one of them is you want to you want to find a a commitment or at least it sounds like you you can't promise it because you you still have your class yet would be if there's a place to post student stories with, this, with a disability to raise the visibility so other people can find it, well, um, I, yeah, I'd like to do that. For, for, for what I've seen from students, mm -hmm. um, both in my disability class and, and even students that aren't in that class but have had me, and obviously I'm, I'm very visibly disabled, um, you often see them, if they do write fiction, will at least put a service dog in because you know, everybody wants to get on the professor's good side. And, Nothing gets on the professor's good side than to make her dog a, uh, a character. Um, but you know, this idea of a kind of a place where students can, or um, early writers can experiment um, with disabled characters might bring 
some of that stigma that you were talking about earlier in your your um, uh, presentation over the the kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't argument. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, um, one of the things that I would like to go back to in the Bayer's discussion about actually a tactic that I would like to bring up is um, the issue of um, staying within the, the disability um, the, the disability arena in academia. I think that that's that, um, one that, that, that keeping it in that Field may be one of the most detrimental things that we tend to do. And I think that maybe one of the most positive tactics that we can do is move it towards maybe the um, realm of arts and um, maybe try to publish it in more mainstream, maybe um, um, art or literature um, publications rather than just disability studies and do presentations there. I think that it's the same with the DCC, although I think that it's very important to uh, make people with disabilities aware that, di that disability characters are um, in, that disability characters are out there, I think it's also very important to also connect them to the general um, mainstream comic fandom. So yeah. Can I also say one thing, um, and then I can give to you, and then and then you. Um, I also think building off of that and building off of the discussions about academia and everything that it's really important to reach out to like constituents of individuals who may not be able to travel or afford to um, go to cons and everything, um, and really doing grassroots outreach, um, whether, you know, maybe through the arts in various marginalized communities or, or, or whatever, you know, uh, to reach out to the, you know, beyond the moneyed groups, I don't know. Um, I, I'm gonna build on that point, and Linda? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. Um, yeah, basically um, economic accessibility, which we probably already talked about, but I'm reinforcing it. Um, bringing, oh, I would say reaching out to community groups in marginalized communities. Um, like one example might be in Syracuse, perhaps the Spanish Action League um, or other groups that do work with community activism and arts and like everything else. Um, in communities that may, where people may not have access to going to cons um, or other things. Um, yeah, um, so the issue of access and also um, Linda? Lydia, sorry. Um, what Lydia was saying about um, young creators working out disability in a low pressure way. Um, and you know, the issue of rights was raised and how if you post it on the internet, you burn your rights. Well, a lot of us are already creating in a forum in which we have no rights, and that's fan fiction. And that's always been a big part of fandom. And it's already a place where disability is being worked out. Um, so I don't know if anyone knows Yuletide. No? Um, it is uh, the Chris, uh, holiday. Oh, holiday. It, yeah, talking about a person for a second. No, no, no it's a um, it's a holiday um, fan fiction exchange, and they've had there's been um, some folks who have had a lot of success um, pushing people to. Um, it's called Dark Agenda, and they've been um, pushing people to include to request and to write um, characters of color, and it's been very successful, and it's only been a couple of years. Um, and they really um, managed to have a lot of productive discussions about racism and fandom through that medium. And I think something like that, um, kind of um, using fan fiction as a way to work out 
I'm, I'm disability. A, I am a wicked person. I, I don't do fan fiction, but I've read enough and I like it and you seem to know enough about it. Would you be willing to build a crip agenda? I can I can do that. Um, can we I already know some for that? I already know some folks who've been doing. It's called Festibility, uh, and it's um, a little it's a little fan fiction um, like fest that's that's dedicated to disabled characters. Mm -hmm. um, and Festibility. Yeah, and and what I think was also interesting that you point out, and, and this is where I'm, uh, and you heard it from me before. I'm like community supporting community. It might be go ahead and talk to the Dark Agenda folks saying, would you guys send it, talk, send it <laughs> out to your members? We want to do this about disability. We'd love to have some crossover. We'd love to have characters of color that happen yeah, to have disabilities. No and basically uh, take advantage of their network. And, 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 and you know, obviously they'll take advantage of, of yours no matter how small. And the idea is we support each other uh, mm -hmm. in increasing that visibility of diverse characters. So I, I think that's fantastic. So... Um, and that's where you're gonna start seeing me start taking off commitments. So Lydia's already promised to help organize um, for next year um, a proposal for a panel that covers the idea of curping the con and taking it there. And I guess you just sort of volunteered to help create a, uh, or expand their, their is it fest festivability or, or creating a crip agenda, whatever. So there's a space there, which um, may also be another place they can help for, for some of the stories. So um, we have an offer for interviews um, Oh, I'm going to call it the wrong name. Geek, was Den, of geek. Den of Geek. I was about to call it the Geek Den, but Den of Geek. Uh, so, so those are three very, very firm commitments of things that are doable. What's your last name, Julie? Uh, Thank you. Sounds like this session has already been very productive. You know, because between now and next year, what can what can we do? And you know, and, and it's kind of one of those. I would I would actually challenge and poke at some of the rest of you. All right, be, are you willing to be interviewed? I mean, if not today, at some point throughout the year, there's going to be an article or a show that's going to cover something you care about, and that's the time to to give a call over to Den of Geek saying, I just saw this episode and I'm mad and it was stupid and I want to talk about it somewhere where where everyone can see it. Um, this is very promising. So. <laughs> there we go. And how would we go about contacting you? I have all these really fun business cards here. Um, I have a Twitter. I have an email. If anyone's interested, I can give. I can put cards up on the front table. That would work well. Um, and please, if you ever have, and if you see things in the news, send them my way. Uh, if you see something that's about accessibility or about a TV show, for for instance, I haven't covered Switched at Birth yet because I I don't you know I I'm, I don't come from a deaf perspective, um, so. For instance, when I'm interviewing you later, maybe we'll talk about switched at birth. <laughs> so you can be reached by email, by Twitter, email, Twitter, um, and that's pretty much the best way to get me. Um, I have my own page on Den of Geek, but it's a little weird to find. Right. So, and, you'll, you'll you'll and I'll put the cards, cards right up, up there. Right. I'll do it right now, actually. So those are those are three very firm things, and I will actually probably pop myself up and make a commitment because I, I tend to already do it similar to um, Lydia's. I do different conventions. Now, granted, I'm in the D.C. area, so I tend to do more Richmond, Maryland, and D.C. with the occasional jaunt up to Pennsylvania. But if, if, if somebody else wants to help me put together proposals for different conventions where we can uh, ask to say, let's do one on, on diversity in fandom or diversity in, in fiction, comics, whatever, I am more than happy to do that with you. Um, so, and um, I have a wife who drives and usually doesn't mind long road trips. So, um, so I'm happy to do that as well. And that's D A Y S M A I L, Days Mail, at gmail.com. So, um, I already know I've got four other conventions this year that I know I'm on the, on the agenda for, but the idea is to keep planning ahead. So, uh, I can tell you that's my commitment. And I know as others of you have other different kinds of conventions you go to. You know, let's let's rely on each other to help help bang this out. You shouldn't have to do it yourself. Can you repeat the email address one more time? Sure, it's Days Mail, D A Y S M A I L, at gmail.com. And how would you like to get past Ray for, for the um, 
the the commitment is I I am going to uh, other fan conventions. They're they're mostly science fiction writing, but if other people are interested in putting together proposals for it for other conventions, at least not too far from my area, although I can drive quite a ways away with my wife, um, I'd be happy to sit on a panel with you. So, or if you want to join me on one of mine, that'd be good too. So. We're going to go Jose and um, Dave and Nick. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, respond a little bit to the previous comment on um, academic um, outreach. And um, it, it, it strikes me that I, I think it doesn't have to be an either or. I think um, there is, I think, a critical mission for, for academia to talk to other academics um, to, um, to mine the, the history of disability, to, um, to look in the uh, interstices of culture um, and, and all sorts of other areas that you kind of, that, you know, trained academics can, can provide. Um, so yeah, I think you can, you can reach out and you can, certainly forums like this are, are, are wonderful, but there's also a role to play within the academy, establishing more disability programs, uh, disability studies minors, all of that so people can major in them or, you know, it's things like that. Uh, all of that has a very important role, it, seem, I think it seems to me, to play. And, uh, uh, so I think we can do both. So is there anything else folks are willing to commit to doing? Um, you had a whole year. I, <laughs> oh. David, they could have their hands up for a couple minutes. Oh, sorry, you guys. So I, I attend, my name is Dave, and uh, I just launched a media company where I'll be uh, publishing my own comic book. And for the sake of confidentiality, I can't disclose too much about that um, <clears throat> without non-disclosure agreement. But um, I will work with Diane. Uh, and in fact, I am committing to this, that I will work with Diane, <clears throat> that any of the line that I produce we'll make it as accessible to people with disabilities as possible, which means investigating perhaps braille or raised print, um, you know, uh, closed caption with visual presentation uh, and any other ideas that, can, that come to mind, I, I will do that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, I think, you know, I, I like to talk about the X-Men because I think this is a, a little bit of a, a model for you know, uh, a fear. Um, you know, I think fear is like an undercurrent here. We will think about Magneto, um, who actually is against humans in a lot of the plot uh, because he can say, well, I'm superior and I don't see what we need them for and they are fearful and dangerous. Um, whereas the humans are also fearful and trying to uh, prepare for uh, the inclusion or exclusion and termination of the X-Men. Um, and, and I'd say that if we could, um, you know, putting things in comics is valid, but I think, you, you know, and, and that kind of gives you a soft landing as, as to the inclusion of all these different people, but like if Wolverine or somebody showed up at your party, you'd probably be fearful of that. So when, when you're talking to fans, maybe, in, challenge them and say, well, this is, this is a light representation of what we're trying to get across, but what if it really happened? You know, what, what if aliens came here? What if you met uh, somebody with um, superpowers? Uh, you know, why are you fearful of this? Why, you know, so inclusion and integration um, has always worked. And I look at Syracuse University, who has taken tremendous leaps to do this, um, the Disability Cultural Center and, you know, the Office of Multicultural Affairs and other things that may carry social stigma um, in, in the general population has caused for a great and, and open and sharing community here at, on campus and has actually been recognized as a, a leader in the world uh, for diversity and inclusion. Um, and I work for the Division of Student Affairs here on campus, so I, I see that firsthand that we have all sorts of departments in place to include and uh, try to beat down the fears of, uh, you know, disabilities and limitations and stigmas that come about socially.
literary scholars, um, historians, um, people who are tenured <laughs> professors who, who have a certain amount of freedom to write about this stuff are, have an important role to play within the academy in terms of formalizing the discipline and obviously getting people, more people to, um, to major in it and to obviously to, to contribute to the building of a cultural and historical legacy for these other groups to also kind of work, work with. Staying on the cutting edge, so to speak. I'm trying to, ma I'm trying to maintain the, the cue. So I'm like, should I take the mic from people or not? It's all good. <laughs> I don't yeah. think that's under dispute. Uh, I think that's, that's very, you know, clearly something that we need. What I think the previous commentator was getting at, though, is that it's very important that we not take these concepts and take this world away from the people who that it originated with and you know what we're talking about in terms of popular culture it's very much something that emerges from the masses we want a dialogue that analyzes it and certainly academia is a very important part of that but we also want to ensure that we can have critical conversations about issues like disability and race and gender um, in popular culture without having to go into the language of academia. So I, I feel like we're on the same page. A but I just actually, I would put it down as, as a parallel. What, what, or right. what was earlier said was, at least as fans, need, we need to recognize that, that our geek is just as valid as anyone else's passion. And, and I think in some ways, what Jose, what you're kind of mirroring is, is also for academics, recognition that this study and this history is just as valid um, as some other areas, and it's important to kind of protect that just as the fan needs to protect um, their passion um, for these kinds of subject matter, and, and, you know, and what we can do to kind of, in some ways, support each other in that. So let's go back to our queue. <laughs> okay, so um, going back to Lydia's comment on uh, fan fiction, I know that we've got, gone a long way off, but I just wanted to uh, bring it back to that, um, there's a there's actually a group of people with disabilities, and you can ask Kara more about it because I'm sh I know that she Kara Leibowitz, the person who did the um, presentation on Star Trek today, uh, I know that she wrote some fan fiction when she was young about the intersection of disability and um, popular culture, and I think that there's a lot of other people who are doing it, but. It, it's, it tends to be younger people, actually, and um, in places like... Um, but the, from what I understand, is the word is being spread through places like um, disability camps and such, and so maybe if there was a way to uh, con connect to the, uh, to the younger generations, I think that would be incredibly useful because I think there's a disconnect after people... So what are some ways, I think that's a really important concept, um, connecting to the younger generation. We've got a lot of youth development programs yeah. in the disability community, the youth leadership forums, um, well, you know, the AAPD summer internship, well, ASAN is uh, a summer leadership academy. How do we bring this conversation about fandom into those circles? I'm, I'm actually thinking of even younger people, like people in, um, middle and high school and um and often those conversations like I said happen in um disability based camps and so I'm I'm wondering if there may be a and oft oftentimes those camps are very isolated they're very um there's a lot of problems to them but I'm wondering if there's a way to maybe bridge 
um, bridge the gap by trying to maybe get um, those disability camps involved. The, the, because there's a subset of culture, so if we can educate maybe the camp directors and the um, maybe in, educate them about more disability um, culture and such, because there seems to be culture developing without the knowledge of the directors there. But how cool would it be to really um, to use to educate the community that's creating this envi this environment that they're unintentionally creating of crip culture about crip culture and maybe bring bring the individuals to the next level. Um, I'm not sure if that was. Yeah, I, I hear actually a couple of things. I think yeah, one of the things you started with was you, you talked about, Kara, and some of the other young folks, that they are having the stuff and they're making it, and maybe it's not connecting. So one yeah. would be, um, uh, I guess, making what, what's happening here and some of these commitments very visible. So people who are doing it say, hey, I'm interested. I do do this here. Let me send my stuff. Let me do my interviews. Let me help you write proposals. So that's, yeah. that's one. The other, um, number two, is actually um, you're looking at... a. I guess an entity like the, these camps that that young young folks with disabilities are at, and actually um, uh, going to those and saying this is an impart, important part of culture, um, and this is where I, I may get what you said wrong. So if so, I apologize. And that is um, that you need to take th either this culture into part of your camp and recognize it and make it a part of it. Uh, I think, is, is, that, is well, that what you're asking, asking for? Well, I actually think that it's the culture, it's very interesting. When people with disabilities get together, for, and oftentimes they're isolated, but, but when, when they come together, specifically in camps um, for people specifically with disabilities, I think that they'll develop the culture by itself, even when it... Um, without the assistance or even the knowledge of the camp um, administration. Mm -hmm. And so, I, so I'm saying, what if we try to educate the camps or try to develop our own camps for people with disabilities that really embrace disability culture and that, that really explicates some of the cultural development that happens there? It's an interesting question. I mean, one thing that comes to mind is um, the uh, young adult book that Harriet McBride Johnson yeah. wrote, which um, I think, what was it called? Accidents, Accidents of Nature. Accidents of Nature, yeah. yes. Uh, which is set at a disability camp. Um, I think one of the interesting challenges that emerges there, I don't think there's an answer to this, so that this is the discussion we should have right now, one of the challenges that comes up there is that very often um, that kind of shared culture often emerges not only without the knowledge of camp administration, but sometimes it emerges in response to and sometimes even in opposition to hmm. the kind of environment that you tend to have in uh, congregate um, settings that often don't always have great ideas in terms of the people who are in charge about disabled people. So we've got to think, you know, in creative ways how we can thread that needle because we want to be accessing yeah. people with disabilities who are in segregated settings and we want to give them the opportunity to connect with disability culture. Mm -hmm. You know, at the same time, we just, we run into this really big challenge. We've got to figure out a way how we address, and maybe it's through creating, you know, things like youth leadership forums for a younger generation that may otherwise be in those mm -hmm. camps. Um, but how do we reach out to them when so often the people who are in charge and um, are being given kind of custody of the people in those settings are not always friendly to our ideas? Yeah. Um, I. Yeah, I I guess my point is I I just see I see a, a um, really awesome opportunity within those camps to really maybe even develop the um, and 
just support the creativity that's be, that's um, happening there, especially in terms of creating a fan fiction and such, um, especially wi with the young generation. That's really my only point. Right. No, so, I think yeah. that's very valuable. And when you think about the writings of you know people like Harriet McBride Johnson, those kinds of settings should be ripe for. Um, fiction and, and writing and creative work. I think that's really valuable feedback. Um, to go back to the uh, academics, um, two weeks ago I was at the Popular Culture Association, American Culture Association National Conference in Washington, D.C. And there are so many topics. They talked about everything. Vamp <coughs> vampires, theater, video games, everything. And, the one, and there's so many different sections. And the one section that wasn't there that really bothered me Disability studies, it wasn't in there, and I'm, I'm just well. There was mental health and mental illness. I was, I presented at one of the sections, but um, and game studies didn't talk about disability. I mean, I'm sure there was probably spread around, but it's not in the same section that, um, where, as you pointed out, disability scholars can come around and talk about these things and all that. And it's a, the convention. I mean, the conference is so, um, so large. Is so widespread. I mean, it's, it's a really difficult conference, but but that's also one way that we could get get together and um, talk about it. I mean, I would be willing to be the chair, but at the same time, I'm really young, and I'm not sure I'm going to the next confer conference, but... Do, you, do I sense a possible commitment there that if someone does organize it, you'd be willing to be involved? I would definitely give a paper. I mean, well, I, there's only so many conventions, conferences I can go to without work firing me, so, um, <laughs> so I uh, have to pick and choose my conferences. But um, no, this is definitely something I would like to see um, happen within the next couple of years. I mean, at least get a section on disability studies at the Popular Culture Association, national conferences, and then you know keep building, keep growing that so that it keeps being visible, it keeps being talked about, and there are, there are a lot of regional popular culture associations too, aren't there? Yes, yes, there is. Um, there's a Eastern Coast, there's a Mid Atlantic, Midwest, um, and that's the interesting thing was that the Mid Atlantic did say disability studies in it, but not the national one. So I mean, it's just a matter of somebody just stepping up and taking responsibility for it, or um, something like that. Your, your last name again? Robart R O. Does anyone else have familiarity with the popular culture? Oh, sorry. Does anyone else have familiarity with the popular culture? I actually series? presented a number of years ago uh, at the Mid Atlantic on the disability studies. Um, I did um, my presentation was uh, dis disabled characters in, in science fiction and fantasy. So, um, right. yeah, the Mid Atlantic has a disability studies group. So, so you could both of you either work together, even if you don't go to help build a panel of people who could submit a proposal then, maybe? Yeah, I think you actually just have to propose to them and if they can find other people interested, they'll have the panel. <coughs> Aha. Okay, do I sense a possible joint commitment? Oh, well, I, I don't know about that, but I was gonna actually suggest, I, I don't know how many people here are academics, whether they're in the faculty or, or staff or, or students, but just about every college out there has a disability awareness week. And one way that you could commit on a smaller scale, um, which might be more doable, particularly for some of the students here, is to approach your college about doing um, a, a disability awareness week where they would encourage students to write fiction or do art. And you could even reach out to the local high schools. I know we've done it at my college, Stockton, a few times, and um, it's been very successful. And that might be a, a way of doing it, uh, getting people to do commitments that are not quite as, as financially <laughs> devastating as cons, uh, which I'm sure most of you will, will agree. And right. most of the conventions are, are expensive to get into. And but you know, the local college level and the community college level, especially where there's a, usually a higher disabled portion of uh, students um, or students that are, will, are always kind of on the fringe, so are more aware of being in minority status, you, you may find a very receptive audience. And colleges love that kind of stuff. So they'll be receptive too.
people. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Then try to save you the trip. Uh, well, I would say that uh, as an individuals, if we went to our local colleges, or even if it wasn't a college you were in, but a college in your community, uh, particularly the, the community colleges, and suggested a Disability Awareness Week project in which they reach out for community um, uh, involvement in you know, encouraging high schools to submit essays or drawings. Uh, you'll be surprised how many you would get um, and how much involvement the, the local community would do for something like that. Freeholders would be involved in, in probably sponsorship if you wanted to go that big, but certainly um, most community colleges and local four years would be interested in doing something for Disability Awareness Week, and that might be a way of, of bringing the younger generation that Ari was talking about in. Um, when, you, when you talk about whether it's fandom or just pop culture in general, I think it's much easier to reach high schoolers and middle schoolers through that route. And then if you add disability awareness to that pop culture, you've, you've given them access to another community and a community they may not have been completely aware of, but rather a fringe community. And, and I don't know, community colleges seem to be a good way of doing that, or, or local four years. Thank you. Actually, I'm just gonna go in the back here. We're gonna talk, we talked about the younger generation. We've got some of the younger generation in the back here. Oh, excellent. We've got several members of the Disability Student Union. They made the space possible, along with the Beyond Compliance Committee. And I think they have a little news for us. Can you tell me about this? This is Eddie Zaramba, he's the president. Tell us, tell us. Well, you know what they say about the, uh, what is it, the problem kids sitting in the back of the bus or something like that, so. Yeah, hi everybody, my name's Eddie and I'm one of the co-founders along with Rachel here and Alex and other people that are in this room that I will not try to name so I don't forget anybody and, and seem <laughs> rude, but um, the Disability Student Union was founded about a year ago and um, we did receive an award tonight for our programming this year called the Macy's Rising Star Award and it's right here. Wow. And, um, and to comment on the Disability Awareness Week theme, um, it's something that we, we started with here at Syracuse University this year we had what we feel is an incredible turnout making buttons, um, using chalk to draw on the quad area, on the, um, the walkways and people you know, to see and to experience disability awareness in different ways. We tried to make it as inclusive as possible within our means, of course, and um, aim to do it again this year. We have a small budget to do something in October again and to continue on with that trend and to make Disability Awareness Month really here at, at Syracuse University something that's um, ongoing and wonderful. Spectacular. Well, that strikes me as an excellent note to start to close on. Do we have any final comments before we I actually do. Or commitments. <laughs> is, there, is there anybody else who has it? Oh, let's give him one more chance and I have like a little sum up. By all means, by all means. Um. <clears throat> I just wanted to say something to elaborate on the gentleman over there who's talking about engaging the youth. I think that <clears throat> is an important uh, strategy because um, I, I think the older we get, the more set in our ways we are. Um, and that by engaging younger generations, eventually uh, these kind of cultural changes kind of grow into society. Um, so I don't know how much extra time I very committed already but I will volunteer to be a chaperone or a mentor for a young group of high school students perhaps um, that could share in an experiential learning or perhaps college students if we could work that somehow into the curriculum where they could get credits uh, or some other you know I know a lot of the programs require uh, community service um, I think it would be also good to involve this program um, where they could spend a lot of time helping or working with people with disabilities, which will then expose them, integrate them, and they'll really just see, hey, we're all human. Um, when I was growing up, I worked for an occupational and physical therapy department. Um, I learned there that, you know, 
as a young child that uh, everybody's just really human. Um, and I think that targeting the younger generations is a very important strategy uh, as, as opposed to trying to change, you know, the ways of the elder generations um, who might be set in their ways. So, so you want to volunteer to be a chaperone or mentor for young adults with disabilities in what particular context? Actually, just uh, it's just to riff off that because I love ideas within ideas, and maybe a simpler start. I, I, I said last weekend I was at a different convention in Richmond, and they had one panel presentation. And this might be an idea for next year. They called it Voices of Tomorrow, and they invited um, six young people to come up and talk about what they thought the future would be like um, in uh, science fiction and fantasy, and what they hoped to see as young people. So, and that might be a much easier, smaller thing would be just to, to, to see about having some folks for a panel next year to talk about what they see as the future with regard to to, uh, to comics and, and, and things like that. Boy, I'd sure go to that panel. Sounds mm -hmm. exciting. Do we have any final comments before we wrap up? Rachel? I just want to, uh, um, one thing we are already making plans for next year. I mean, we have ideas, we're making notes. I have a five page list of people, both in academia, in uh, the, the industry, that, that are on our dream list. Um, so if there's anybody in this room who has any ideas of who to invite, uh, you know, email the CRIPCON address or the, the website or the Facebook page, etc. cetera. Um, we would definitely want to know about it because we're doing it again. And if anybody has con contacts, they know that might be helpful. Yes, that way you're not exactly. Saying, I would really like this person to yeah. offer the contacts to help. So. And, and one, this is kind of off, but I don't know if people know it, but at Comic-Con, it's not just a Comic-Con. They actually have an academic conference going on at the same time. A lot of these cons do, so... I think we would like to do that too. Not only would we like to sit here and talk about this, but we want to, you know, have vendors and people dressing up. And so I think we would like to make that a little bigger next year. So two days, you know, I can wear my full Gandalf costume, not just part of it, that kind of thing. So. Well, it sounds very exciting. Folks, thank you all so much for taking the time. And I can't wait to see many of you next year and also we are sure that you will be in touch all right it's a great great close for a great convention thank you everybody thank you